don't think we're there too, which means, yes, it was this is something different. I think it means go ahead, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, welcome everybody. Uh, I uh, thought that um, Suzanne Tertial was being irritatingly uh, by, the, uh, by the book when she told me um, that uh, we could not accept any more people into uh, this room and because others, some of our colleagues were asking, can I come to the meeting? And I said, sure. And then when uh, I, I uh, asked Suzanne, she said, uh, no, we really are full, and now I can see that we really are full. So, uh, if that's a measure of success, uh, congratulations. Uh, what? She says it's full. Yeah, I am a slow learner. I am slow. No, what it means is I'm not law abiding, uh, and so I'm trying to. Uh, well, I'll amend my ways. So. I, there's a very charged agenda t today, and you'll hear a lot about the move, uh, things that are moving forward in I2B2. But I want to share with you the, the following perspective. The importance of having a perspective that understands data out of the healthcare system. Because not all data is actually the same. Although they all appear internally in the, your computer as a uh, floating point representation or an ASCII representation of that number, they actually have very different meanings. And I'll illustrate that with a, a recent uh, adventure I had, well not adventure, uh, encounter. A very nice man, well dressed, far better dressed than I am, uh, and uh, younger than I am, and believe it or not, faster talking than I am, was in my office, and he uh, is the CEO of a very well funded uh, data science slash predictive analytics company, uh, West Coast. And he um, wanted to hear what we were doing. And I have to say, he was super nice, not at all condescending, but really pretty fast and enthusiastic and um, working on a lot of uh, uh, exciting projects. So then I showed him a graph. And this was a graph from Griffin Weber. Is Griffin here? Oh, there's Griffin. Griffin's in the back there. And Griffin um, had developed this graph. He had done it for every single um, lab value in, in medicine. So over 6,000 different labs. But this was a graph on just one lab value, white blood count. But he'd done this for all um, lab values. And what he did was to show for males in my age range, unfortunately, 50 to 65, how likely are you to die in the next three years based on your white blood count? And so I showed this uh, CEO, MIT trained, I should say, so it's East Coast and West Coast uh, component to this story. And I said, look, this low white blood count at, three, at between uh, midnight and 8 a.m., this low white blood count is highly correlated with a survival rate less than 50%. You're more than 50% likely to die. And look, this white blood count between 8 a.m. and uh, 4 p.m. is associated, is correlated with a, a mortality rate of only 3%. You have a 97% chance of living five years. So I asked him, why is this? Why is this huge difference in survival? Thought, 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 thought. Oh, yeah, circadian rhythm. <laughs> nice try, but not even close. And I explained to him the following. If a nice young woman or man comes to you at 3 o'clock in the morning and sticks a needle into your arm at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's not because they like you. <laughs> it's because they're really, really worried about you. Whereas if it's at 9 o'clock in the morning, it's just a routine blood drain. 
And just by looking at the white blood count, you would never be able to figure that out. But if you knew anything about healthcare, you'd know that the time of day was not a biological signal. It was a signal of the way the medical system operates. And that, and of course, in my mind I was thinking, wow, if anybody ever shows up to me at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'll tell them, go away. Go <laughs> But the point is, in most data science perspectives, as we're being pulled data finally through efforts largely of this community out of electronic health records, there is a group of people who don't know anything about healthcare who are going to be modeling this data, coming up with predictive analytics, as this company was, and actually selling them to some of our insurers. And they treat this stuff that I just described as noise and noise that they have to overcome. But it's actually pretty dangerous noise because it's biased noise. And it's so very hard to account for bias. And uh, Griffin and I call this health system dynamics, which is there's two physiologies that, we're, that are involved in this analysis. One is the physiology obviously, of the patient. And we're actually getting pretty good about that. But then there's the physiology of the healthcare system. So it's more than just time of day. Any of you who have ever been in the area of healthcare system know the day of the week, the meaning of a, of a blood test, just knowing it was taken on a Sunday is different from that, uh, uh, is different predictably than that same uh, blood test drawn on a Monday. Whether it's in an outpatient lab or an ICU lab, all have different values and uh, in terms of what they mean for the patient. And yet, if we have this goal, which is whether it's to stratify medicine from precision medicine to find the right drugs, whether it's quality measures to understand whether people are doing the right thing, if we don't actually explicitly model that part of the healthcare system, both healthcare system dynamics, we're missing a vast swath of the signal. So the good news for me about this meeting is that by and large, all of you are deeply embedded in the healthcare system. And therefore, you are uniquely positioned to be able to take data from uh, the bedside and actually accurately interpret it for translation to care and to science. And I think the reason that I share that with you today is because one of the signs of our collective success is that we've created a market for all these data analytic companies in healthcare. And that's great. But I'm telling you that your responsibility is not close to ending. There's certainly much that has to be done in terms of methodological development and data infrastructure, and you'll hear about this extensively today. But I'm here to tell you that you have a responsibility towards your doctors and your healthcare system, and even your C-suite, who don't understand some of these issues, but who will be making incredibly expensive and harmful mistakes if they don't understand it. So just let me congratulate you on being uh, where you are on the front line of uh, data science and medicine. And I can tell you that uh, we have a really uh, good day uh, prepared for you. There's much more that could be covered that we have available time for today. And I'll, with that, I'll leave it to uh, Sean Murphy, who you well know. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Zach, for that mini keynote. Uh, and um, so I thought that Zach was going to tell you all about another of Griffin's uh, many uh, endeavors. And one of those is that Griffin made this beautiful um, chart of big data. That should include, yeah, that was a great one. And uh, this beautiful chart of big data shows, you know, that there's healthcare data that we traditionally think of, labs, diagnoses, and so forth, and they actually occupy a fairly small corner of what turns out to be an enormous universe of genomic data, imaging data, mobile health data, and I can't do justice, although Griffin can go on with the many different kinds. So, our challenge in I2B2 
is actually to continue with our endeavor, which is really getting healthcare data to the fingertips of researchers for clinical studies and analytics. That's really what we've been doing in all these years, creating query tools, allowing researchers to get in touch with the data, to get the data at their fingertips so they can further science. And yet, we have all these different new kinds of data. So for example, we've got data that lives in the Department of Genetics. And the geneticists, you would think that, you know, they would willing, be willing to come over and work with all of our uh, IT folks, you know, who have well, ties on or sitting over at uh, Partners Healthcare and so forth. And no, you wouldn't, right? Um, they're not going to do that. They're going to continue their ways of manipulating big data in uh, BCF files and putting it into structures that they're familiar with and with annotations that they're familiar with. And they, they work very hard, but they create a database that looks different than what we traditionally create out of coded data and, um, and other kinds of data that we traditionally look at in the healthcare system. And radiology is in the exact same boat, right? They have tons of data, I would say. You might, you might think of them as the most meticulous phenotypers in uh, conventional clinical care. But their data ends up looking like a huge compendium of DICOM images, which, again, is not easily searched or even procured through our uh, central loading processes. And the same can be said for pathology, with many of their new kinds of data that they are developing. And it goes on and on with M health data and so forth and all the data types that Griffin put together in his chart. But it has to live now with this healthcare data that traditionally comes out of the hospital. Because even though you've got all these new types of data that are emerging and being incorporated into healthcare and becoming very important, we certainly aren't leaving behind the data that we traditionally collect out of the healthcare system. And so really what we're doing is we're just trying to find patients who are common in all these databases so we can extract patients who have data from the healthcare system, also have genomic data, also have some imaging data, also have some pathology data, also have some mHealth data, and we can put the, that data together and do research using all of these big data types. And that's really where uh, we've been going the past uh, uh, year and a half or so, is envisioning a system that can do that. Now the problem is that the, the traditional star schema of the I2B2 fact table which I'm kind of showing here in our system, is uh, traditionally loaded by our ETL processes that we've meticulously developed, we've all fallen in love with, and we know very well how they operate. And they give us the beautiful results that we can see and show to our researchers in their query tool, and the researchers will do the queries, and that makes them happy. But what happens when we have unstructured data like text from our notes repositories, which really has to be indexed in a totally new, different way. It's not like a, it, it, it's not that um, it's a data type that we're not familiar with. We know how to take notes and we can index them, but it just lives in a different way in a database with a different kind of indexing strategy, which makes it really much more convenient to put it in its own database and manage it separately than the big, uh, uh, compendium of clinical data. The same goes for genomic data, the same goes for our biobank data, the same goes for imaging data, and et cetera, et cetera. And so what we've been doing is looking at a way in I2B2 that we can make a distributed query system where you can have data that ultimately does need to be indexed in an I2B2 fact table. That is the common denominator is that the index has to end up looking like an I2B2 fact table. But it can be managed by independent teams, and the data that goes is used as raw data to put into the fact table can be big data of various kinds with features pulled out of it that we then put in the fact table. And it's not expected that the same team that does the enterprise loading over on the clinical data side is going to be doing the loading for unstructured data, genomic data, file bank data, and so forth. 
So the system uh, to create a distributed query tool would take advantage of the fact that all these different data sources could live in the enterprise and that they could then be queried through a common query system, which ends up looking just like the query tool of I2B2. And yet, it has a new section of um, uh, ontology where that ontology is going to direct a search to a totally different database. And that, so that you can use, for example, the normal uh, items like diabetes, coded diabetes measurements, and the whole hierarchy of coded diabetes measurements out of your healthcare system, your hemoglobin A1Cs, right, out of your healthcare system. Some of, the la some of the medications even that were indexed in your healthcare system, but here we can add a free text search to notes to get more types of medication. So if you have an, uh, a new kind of med uh, uh, medication that treats diabetes with um, the pumps in your kidneys that help uh, uh, excrete glucose and keep it out of control that way, you can look for it as soon as it comes on the market, you don't rely and, and search through it in free, free text but just like you would any other item, so that your researchers don't have to relearn how to use uh, the query tool, they just have to just use it the same way they always did. Um, they'll get a, little, a different value box that they'll look up, and we'll go into that in great detail, because the value box is now gonna say, you know, it needs to search through free text, and, help, and it needs to do certain restrictions to do this. We're going to show you examples of how we have been using this technology in the partner's biobank and how we've been developing specialized hives. And so we do have this biobank at partners, has about 40k patients with lots of different new data types. And one of the things we've been trying to be very careful of is understanding the quality of the data for science. And much of the, the work that goes into collecting the big data and putting it through the ringer, so to speak, is really to improve its quality to the, the degree it needs to be improved to do scientific research. Now, Victor Castro is gonna go into some detail about how this is done, but many of you know already, you take the features from the phenotypes of the patients, which includes healthcare data, and can start with codes. And if you start with codes, and you look at it, for example, you will get a ton of asthma patients, right? 7,600 asthma patients. Um, you will get uh, 10,000 patients with, um, sorry, uh, 3,000 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And you will um, uh, think that you have that many patients and that those are the ones you should use in your research studies. But the fact is that if you went in and used something like depression that was coded, and you, uh, uh, plotted that on a ROC curve. The yellow dots are what you would get if you use the code for depression at each encounter to determine if the patient was actually depressed or not. And the fact is that this is gonna be a very important determination because if a patient's getting better from their depression, right, and you wanna see if they have treatment-resistant depression or not, you need to know if they are depressed at each encounter. But the fact is that the ROC curve shows uh, a random guess with that uh, pink orange line in the diagonal. And the orange dots show what your determination of depression would be if you used coded data. And you notice it's almost a random guess. However, if you use uh, NLP to extract features out of unstructured documents, and you use lots of other features from the medical record, not just the codes, but also the um, medications that they're on, and uh, whether they're getting certain procedures like electroshock therapy, you will uh, be able to make a much better determination of whether they are depressed at the visit or not, and that will give you a much better looking <coughs> receiver operating curve, which actually has an 87% uh, uh, positive predictive value. So by cleaning up the data using fairly complicated algorithms, which Victor will, uh, will, will, will go through, um, you can take this relatively raw counts data that you get from the um, coded uh, codes that are, are, are used for billing and, and, and physician communication and make them into codes that are actually good for doing scientific research. 
Now, usually, it means that you're going to have less patience when you've done all that work that actually have the disease versus the coded data. But of course, that's because that indicates that about 50% of these were actually wrong, right? But that, once you've cleaned it up that way, now you can actually match your genotype data so you can say how many patients in the biobank are genotyped who actually have um, asthma or actually have bipolar disorder. And you can tell clinicians or researchers can you do a research project where you're actually going to be able to use scientific quality data to <coughs> gather new associations with variants in the genomic data? So in a way, we've gone right to the end game. So we haven't said, oh, we're going to look at like whether each value is uh, accurate you know, and in, in, in represents an encounter or not, right? It's really saying, look, just take a machine learning approach and fit the data that exists into a supervised learning algorithm, which is going to be able to get right to this point of, is it a true phenotype or not for the patient? And that is what this big data is going to let us do. So in, in, at a first pass, it looks kind of unkempt, and then it's just all out there. But through these machine learning approaches, you can take that data and make gold out of it and proceed with true science in ways that have never been actually thought through in healthcare before. Cool result. Let me encourage everybody, if you want to tweet, tweet this, or not, hashtag I do me too. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. The, the king of communication. And here's this, just some examples that we're going to go into, into in, in great detail of how you can use these um, big data repositories to actually query for specific genotypes and then match them with specific kinds of phenotypes and use these phenotypes in conventional uh, I2B2 queries. I call them conventional, but of course all the work's been done in the background where you've taken your um, um, learning approaches to the big data and then you can classify them as another ontology item that then you can proceed through in true uh, scientific queries, getting results which are uh, extremely meaningful out of your right to be too system. And then we're going to be showing you ways that you can proceed to um, download the data. Now, uh, there is a um, true and tested way that I2B2 protects patient privacy by obfuscating data such that when you do queries uh, that give you back counts, you don't endanger the patient's privacy when you uh, have a very specific set of traits on a patient. When you get to downloading data, we're really getting into the limited data set world, and we're assuming certain things. We're assuming, for example, that they have a limited a, a data use agreement signed or something of that nature, which we have for the biobank, but that would be the situation. So when you get a matrix of data, right, an Excel spreadsheet of data, that you are uh, aware of like who's that this is a different class of user that you need, but so we're making an easy way for them to get data, but it does represent a different class of users. So you're going to have your class of users that can see obfuscated data, no problem, and then you can make some of those users ones that see limited data sets, no problem, sign data use agreements, and can get to these uh, spreadsheets that we're going to be showing. And this is ways that we can get big data out of the system and ultimately achieve a goal that um, we've really been focusing on with um, smart apps. So the fact is that once you've done all this work, it gives you a very good way to do something that clinicians do every day. When we look at a patient and we say, huh, I wonder how this patient's gonna do, right? And we know that they've got <coughs> arthritis, and we know that um, they've got a family history which isn't so good, and we say, you know, I saw a few other patients like this, and you know, they were doing well until they were about 50, and then they started to deteriorate rapidly. So I need to think about that very carefully and put them on some medications that's going to preempt that, right? Every day, clinicians are doing this. They're kind of taking a patient in front of them and comparing it to similar patients that they've seen before. Now, big data and these kinds of distributed and big query systems let us do this 
so that we can find similar patients in a highly specific, highly mechanized way and present that to the clinician. You're doing the same thing as you're doing, the researchers are doing in the I2B2 query, but now let's do it for clinical purposes, right? Looking at patients to help predict uh, similar patients so we can determine you know, responses to therapy, the course of their disease, the penetrance of genetic variants. One of the things that's very apparent is that just because you have a variant of, of a disturbance that supposedly should mess up your protein, um, a, a essential protein for cell function, um, if you take patients that weren't not similar to the ones where that was determined in the first place, let's say uh, um, Asian males, and you go and look at it in African American females, it turns out that for mysterious reasons that variant does not predict the same disease as it did in the Asian males. The reason is, you know, there's lots of things that regulate genomics rather than just the actual existence of the variant. But the fact is that you can help make that prediction by just saying, well, was the prediction made from similar patients or not? And so that way you can understand the penetrance of genetic variants by looking at similar patients. And, for, and finally, making sure that a diagnostic testing pathway will be fruitful, of course, because a lot of times we go down these false alleys where we're trying to figure out what a patient has. What we should really do is just look at similar patients and not have to do all that testing that uh, can be destructive for the patient and cost a great deal of money. And this finding similar patients can be very computationally intensive, but a perfect opportunity in our space for us sitting here for combining data from the electronic healthcare system, these specialized health databases, these specialized hives that we're developing uh, uh, in this room, analytics for big data queries, which people developing in this room, and their presentation ultimately is something we call smart apps. We've looked at smart apps several times, and that, I think, is the key to being able to take the big data out of the patient information commons, perform analytics, and then push it up into clinical care where it's visible through the electronic health record towards over that line. And it ends up in the hands of the clinician, ends up in the hands of the clinician so that they can actually view all of those analyses in a very uh, uh, friendly way. All of our work reduces to something simple that they can look at. And the labs can use it as well, that same simple to check the results, and the core integration happens in our uh, databases. And these smart apps are reality. They are um, being infused in many healthcare uh, uh, platforms, including uh, Epic and Cerner. And, um, and it's a simple presentation. So here's a growth chart, which all of you have probably seen at some time or another. Uh, maybe even when you were kids, you, you, you looked at it. And you see it has this nice, familiar uh, uh, appearance of, as a kid gets older, you see, make sure that their weight and their stature is falling within what we consider to be the norms, comparing them to similar patients, right? But with this now, we can actually do some analysis and say, you know, what is the deep meaning behind the familiar growth curve and various uh, factors that, and percentiles that are falling out? And it can take it a step further. So you're not just a conventional kid, you know, looking at all, you know, millions of others. You can actually pick out, um, is, the, is the kid's height compare okay if you take the parent's stature into consideration and their body stature and so forth. So there's a lot more you can do now with the big data, but it's still the same process. We do the same thing with images. Believe it or not, kids who are between uh, zero and six years old have a very difficult time getting their MRI images interpreted because the MRI is changing so much as the myelin grows and makes more fat, which is MRI images show. But by looking at similar patients, you can compare out of the PAC system hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, MRIs on normal kids, which is an important machine learning experience, right? Because why does a kid get an MRI? I mean, they wouldn't be normal. Well, some of them are but it's actually very difficult to find the normal ones. So you need a lot of machine learning to do that. But once you have, you can put together these compendiums of normal kids at all these different day intervals to give a continuous appearance of what an MRI looks like to compare with the MRI that's in front of the clinicians so they can tell whether the uh, kid has an abnormal MRI or not. And you can make all kinds of interesting, fancy displays 
out of these smart apps. And you can determine something very straightforward, which is a nice, simple thing. Is a patient taking their medication or not? And they get a check mark if they are, and they get a red diamond if they aren't. And um, that's a nice display, but actually there's a ton of analysis and, 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 and that goes behind this, comparing them to other experiences in other patients. That lets you determine, for example, here, that this patient has been computing to take their medication in this one, uh, and, and they're not taking uh, uh, this medication based on their adherence patterns of former patients and their prescription and their ability to fill their prescriptions or, and so forth. So this actually takes us into another realm where we can use big data to actually improve healthcare using the very systems that we're creating. Um, predicting outcomes, learning about differences in people that are important for predicting disease, understanding disease variants, and interpreting features in medical images and tissues from pathology. And all this, of course, is not possible without an enormous team, which uh, we have some of our core team members uh, on this slide. We have many that I probably um, left out but I think that everybody in this room is probably considered to be uh, more or less uh, a team member here. Um, and I see um, you all and are very I welcome you here. So uh, thank you. And um, any questions before we move into the next phase of our agenda? Michael looks like he wants to say something. <laughs> so the slide that you put up that had uh, numbers of patients by being correct. Yeah. And the uh, more refining of the yeah. And yeah. the um, those of the Yeah. Um, and it sort of implied that that was a more refined number. But it yeah. was just the number of patients you had who had been genome cut. Create that here. Yeah, that's correct. So Mike was pointing out that the number on the far right here is not the, 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 the refined, a, a, a more refined number than the one that's immediate, that's in the square. The refined number is the one in the square. And the point to be made here is that if you didn't, hadn't refined the patients, you would not know how many had, you had genotyped. That's the point to be made. And, and, and a deeper point, I guess, is that if you don't know, if, if, even if you had genotyped them all, if you had like 50% wrong, in terms of what the phenotypes were, when you run your association algorithms, the noise is going to overcome anything that you've done. So you still need to refine number from machinery to make use of the association. Right, that's exactly right. So it's important so that the associations are actually good associations. Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> it's just a comment. Uh, uh, so I was really uh, interested in the final part of the, of the evolution of the system that goes back to the single patient. And it seems that what we are really working on is to define a new uh, approach that is a sort of case-based reasoning or allows the decision maker who is the clinician in front of the patient to take proper decision by retrieving similar cases. But with respect to the past, where well, we one has had to select the case base <coughs> in the case based reasoning, now this is possible to do through data integration. So I basically profile my patient and I get patients with similar profiles on the fly, and then I take the decision. So it seems that this is very interesting, very powerful, and that's where we probably should go further with our work, at least part of our work. Yeah, thank you for that insight. I know you've been working on this for a long time, so I... Ricardo, I think it's a tremendous idea, and I know you have been working on it in the past, but I think that I would like to call on you uh, to take on a leadership role to make this happen, because um, I think there is a set of functionalities that can uh, run on the ITP2 infrastructure, which essentially says, parameterize in a variety of different ways, find patients like this one, and just getting to do, getting that and getting that to work in a robust parametrizable fashion across ITB2 instances, I think would be very interesting all the way from stratified medicine to patient recruiting to decision support. So I think I could imagine a nice workshop just focusing on using the EHR to find patients <coughs> me. 
Lee or this one. Absolutely. All right. Now we're going to totally switch gears. So um, get away from the visionary and into the practical. Um, so I'm going to call uh, Land Kiowa. And um, let me see, I got a thing. I got to wait to go away. Or there we go. You are practical, and that's why we love you. So, as many of you are aware, but some of you are not, there is now an I2B2 foundation. So NIH has a time limit on all <coughs> grants, basically, that can support infrastructure, which is 10 years. And once 10 years is over, you're essentially on your own. Now, of course, many of us have, and including many of us here at Harvard, have uh, grants that are based off by 2 b 2 and that helps uh, sustain those, the i 2 b 2 uh, infrastructure because um, we need to in order for those grants to actually fulfill their obligations. Having said that, it makes a very specific uh, action on I2B2, which often is excluding like the community and like what they need generally to have happen with the software. And so we created the I2B2 Foundation to explicitly address the fact that there are, uh, there's thoughtfulness and uh, uh, resourcing and communication and um, engagement that has to happen in the I2B2 community in order to make sure that we fulfill our obligations to all of you. Um, and that is uh, what the foundation is really about. Established in <coughs> January of 2016 officially as a business been going on for a while, but it wasn't like officially established as like a, 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 an actual uh, entity that you can now look up in the mass uh, uh, registry of businesses, right? So it's a nonprofit, of course. Um, it's uh, so far been the one responsible for some of the things that uh, Janice, and she's going to show you these in just one second, have done revamping the, the community wiki initiating software distribution through the GitHub, and enabling automated distribution of web client plugins now that you can, that, that you can do. And then I think the biggest thing we've done today is hiring uh, Diane Keo over here, who's going to be our managing director, and will um, be the source of all good. Um, and we just want to note that Trinetics has been very important to um, supporting I2B2. Janice, you want to show a few things? So as Sean stated, my name is Janice, and I, did, am, I primarily did a lot of the testing and some of the initial documentation, and my focus is now being doing that, but also really getting the community uh, improvements out there. So some of the things that we did is we categorized it basically into three different areas that we need to focus on, one being the wiki. Uh, I think I'm amongst friends here, so I can say the wiki had a great purpose in the beginning, but it kind of lost a little bit of oomph, and now we're trying to rebuild that by getting everyone's information in one central place, because we have documentation spread out. We have it on the, the i2b2.org site, we have it on the community wiki, or we have it in a zip file, so we really want to get it in one place that makes it easier for everyone else. The other big, big piece is the repository. That's the GitHub that you're hearing about. 
if we can get all our code, which we have done, which I will show you, in, in an area that's public, where you can access it. You can either fork it off, you can download it, um, you can uh, make suggestions on bug fixes that we can review or enhancements that we need to make. But the other, the other big, huge component that I see is the plugins. Everyone in this room has developed their plugins for their, whether it's for their client, a new cell, uh, a server plugin, the pro one of the things that we want to do is be able to emphasize the great work that everyone's done and get your work out there and visible by other people. The way to do that is to have one central area that they can go and see the plugins that are available. Because right now it's kind of word of mouth. Um, so we have created a repository for the plugins and we're uh, improving the wikis to the plugins, but we've also made improvements that I'll show you in a minute in creating a gallery. Um, and with the web client, we have an automated tool that allows you to select the plugin and then have it automatically install into your web server for you uh, and configure it. So basically, just to quickly move things along, we're improving the content, the layout, the core repositories, the plugin repositories, and then also a plugin gallery and a plugin installer. So for the community wiki, um, let me just kind of see if I can jump to it. It's probably easier to show it to you. It's not showing the same screen. Looks. Well, I don't want to waste waste time for people. Um, basically, I have a lot to look at too. I think if you go to the use slideshow and then click the good memory. Oh, that, that, that didn't, didn't work. work. <laughs> <laughs> this is our new community wiki. Um, <laughs> as you can see, all the information is easily accessible. Um, there we go. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> so basically, this is uh, the initial layout that we're having. And, and again, as I go along, I'm finding things that aren't working. So you may see some, some changes. But basically, we'll have, you have a documentation area where we're going to list uh, what's available for developers. We'll get the online help into here instead of just needing to only access it through the client itself. The releases page, this goes right to where uh, the, all the release notes are. Uh, for each uh, release. And then you have your support pages, and this is the big area that I'm hoping to get really going. And that is creating a knowledge base, or a how-to, um, or troubleshooting. So if you're installing the I2V2 and you're hitting on this era, try and check these things. The big thing about all this community stuff is I need everyone's help with contributing to it. Um, by giving us either information, tips that have helped you, and so forth, and then we can get them in here, and then that will help everyone else. Um, the software just brings us to the repository, so if someone wants to really quickly go to the repositories, they can. Um, and then the other big area that I'm working on developing is the events page, and basically this is where, uh, right now you only have this uh, here, but we're gonna post information slideshows from, for instance, we were at AMIA in March, so we'll, um, in the process of starting to post those, um, and slideshows from today so that you can go back and review them and look at them. The big thing also is down here, we have all our community projects so that they're new, and we're gonna, we're going to create a template for all of you so that if you come to me and say, I have this great plugin, I wanna make it available, we put it into the GitHub, and then from the GitHub, uh, we can create a wiki page for you where you can put all your documentation about it. Um, but we'll make it a template so that it's much easier for you to go and just fill in the information that you need to. While I'm got this page up, rather than go through the slides, I'm just going to say, here is where we did our GitHub. So we have all our core. Um, 
basically the source code for our, our server side, our web client, our data, and the workbench. One of the things I do want to point out that to emphasize is that if you're taking your source code from here to update your environment, when we zip it up onto the ITV2 org site, in the server code, we include the admin piece of it. That, the admin piece is really just the web client with some minor changes. So rather than have source code in two places and risk it getting out of sync, all of it's in the web client. And here in the install readme, you will see how to make the changes so that when you download this, to also place it on your server uh, so that the admin piece cannot be added and working. Because what we don't want to have happen is you update your web client, but then your admin is out of date. So you want to make sure that you're, you're um, doing that. <clears throat> the other big piece of the repositories is here are the community plugins. So what you're seeing here are some plugins that have been developed either by the ITV2 team or by community members. And you'll notice that what I tried to do is create a naming convention to make it a little bit easier in that if you see WB in front of it, it's a workbench plugin. WC is a web client plugin. And then you'll see cell. So then you know that that's a new cell. Uh, some of them are going to have all components into it. Uh, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with that yet. But, um, so we would love to be able to get your plugins here because the other big piece, remember I said there were three components, is with the plugin gallery. Um, and we had a team that we released um, pieces, or most of it, actually let me take this first. Nitch Wadden uh, Austin, he developed this page that we're eventually going to make public. And basically what it is, is it allows you to go in and to see all of the plugins that are available for you to install. Uh, so what you're seeing here is you can look at ontology plugins. And you, there'll be a list of all the ontology plugins, web client or server plugins. Um, and then when you click on one to find out more information, you have more information on the, the author, what, what release it was tested with, with the I2B2, so that you know you can download the zip file here. Um, so this hopefully will be coming out uh, relatively soon. The other piece that I do want to explain to you is that in the I2B2 now, in 1.707, we included a plugin installer. And basically what that installer does is it um, let's see if I have a slide. I'm going to post this because rather than take up time from Diane, um, this is basically the process that you're seeing here of how to request for a new plugin. I'm here all day also, so if you have questions, um, feel free to ask me. And at any time, you can email or call me. Um, the, I guess I hit it because I knew I was running out of time, but there, basically what the installer allows you to do is as an admin, I can go in and I can select, if a, if a researcher comes up to me and says, oh, I saw this great plugin available, can we use it, can we install it? As the admin, you just have to go into the admin tool, click on plugin gallery, select that plugin, and then you can select install, or if you want to manually do it, you can do download. But if you do install, what's going to happen is, it's going to go um, to where the repository is, grab the code, it's then going to install it on your web server, because obviously there's some setup that needs to be done by you. And then it will automatically make it available to those users with the right security settings. So if it's something someone who has obfuscated um, security shouldn't see, then they won't be able to use it. So we do all that process for you, and I can explain it in uh, much detail. Uh, at any point today. I'm trying to think if I have a... Our agenda is now <laughs> I just didn't want to uh, take away from... I can show a piece of... Yeah. But that's... 
that's the not the admin. That's right, right. Yeah, you know, I, I can't get to the admin for that, but I can show you where it would be. Um, so basically, on the Harvard demo, here in analysis tools, we made some changes, and there's a drop down menu. That won't work. If you want to stop by and see me, I'll show you it <laughs> at any point. Uh, I apologize for the I'll try and swipe it over. Okay, so of course now I'm trying to see where here we go, analysis tools. There's now a drop down menu. Those tools that you're seeing there are already installed in your web client environment. So, as a user, because this is the user, this is the web client, they can go ahead in and look at a plugin gallery that this is one piece that we will be working on improving. But basically, you can get all the information here. They can click and see the wiki page for it, they can do the user manuals. But what's missing from here is the download and install. Where you see that there would also be a download and install button, um, but that's only accessed through the admin tool by an admin who has rights to install something onto your server. There's some setup on the back end that we do. Um, and if I go, one of the key pieces that's gonna be from, from you is that Sorry, this is a little awkward. You will notice, so we have an ITV2 catalog that I maintain, and this is used so that we know where the repositories are. So no one can, um, I update this. And it, all it does is it points to a manifest that you have to provide in your plugin. And I'll show you with the manifest in one second. And it doesn't, expose anything about your environment other than this is where the manifest is in my GitHub um, repository. So if I look at The other thing to note, um, looking at this right now, you'll notice I have this tag at the end, in development. This is a new repository that we're setting up with a site that has developed something. But I put in development so that you as the community will know, oh, don't download that yet because it might be missing code. Uh, it's not ready, available. Once this becomes available, I'll, excuse me, I'll remove the in development from the the name so that you know that uh, it's something that you can use. This should have So, um, as you can see, Janice has been working hard to allow people to publish their work, is what it amounts to, right? So you, um, you can either publish it on our GitHub, or with that manifest thing that Janice is showing you, you can actually point to your own uh, setup GitHub if you want, and people can then be able to get um, plugins from there. Now, we control where you're able to go so that, you know, it's not like anybody can go and put a plug in there that does who knows what, right? 
but um, but we are setting that up so that um, we can get the plugins more visible. For example, in that um, gallery, um, and and uh, get your work out there. Okay. So now Diane. It's going to um, talk about some of the uh, um, core elements that we have to work through in the foundation. And we set aside a little bit of time now, and then we're going to gather some data from everyone about like what they're doing and how they want, uh, or what's their needs. But also, we have a, a big block at the end of the conference to go through. Um, where we can go into more depth, especially things that will like come up during the meeting. We thought it was good to, and then we can have people talk about what they're doing and how we can have that incorporated into the plan. So they have. So this is really meant to be kind of an open session because I think we, we, we don't we need input from from you about how we're going to organize this foundation. Um, I'm not new to I2B2. I took a three-year sabbatical um, to implement Epic, and I have to tell you, after that, I'm so thrilled to be done. <laughs> 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 right. Right. So yeah, that's good. So um, knowing what I know about the, B, the big EHRs, um, I2B2 is needed. Okay, it's, it, they're not going to be able to solve it um, without um, you all extracting the data and figuring out how to do all these wonderful things. Um, I was actually in the meeting, um, what is it, 12 years ago or so, with uh, Zach and Sean and Henry Chue and John Glasser when they were um, talking about um, submitting uh, a, a grant proposal for I2B2. And I, at, at that time, I had no idea. Driving biological projects, I kind of got that, but this high thing, I had no idea what they were talking about. So it's really exciting to see where it's coming. Um, so it, it, it's great to be here, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have something to really focus on, um, too, at this point. So, so what, do we, what do we need to do? We, there's kind of two things. Obviously, financial support. Um, we'll need to, to figure out a model on how we um, expand the number of supporters. Um, so I'd you know, love to hear feedback from, from folks about how we can, we can work with industry or maybe um, some of the, the users to kind of put a model together. Um, and then, you know, and then also talk about what you're going to get out of that support too, because I think we need to have a, a roadmap and a plan uh, to make it easier um, for, for folks to, um, to get access to all the great things that are out there. So, you know, and it can it continue, the fir first thing is, is continue the current support. Um, you know, Janice just just presented some of the, the work that she's doing to make it easier for folks to um, to get access and and, um, and see what's going on. Uh, and so we've got to do that, you know, code management, plug-in distribution, ontology management, that type of thing. Um, but also, and this is really my last slide, so I really want people to, to start to think about it. What, what's the future? You know, should we should we put together, you know, more seminars and training? Should we have a a monthly, you know, I2B2 user call where we talk about, um, you know, sh you know what needs to be done in the app it, it, with the with the, the software. Or what are people doing? Um, you know, managing HR extraction um, tool library. So, Sean, you're telling me that Epic is going to have a, a, a tools in 2016. I didn't know that. Yep. So in their April they meeting. Promise? <coughs> they said that. They promised. <laughs> well, I mean, who promises what? Yeah, but I'll have to figure but, out what that means. Yes. Okay. Very good. Yes, you I got friends over there. Yes, that's, that's exactly. Yeah, so all I'm saying in that slide is in the April extreme user group, what's the XUG? Expert user group. Ex okay, not extreme expert. Okay. Uh, <laughs> expert user group meeting. So they announced officially that they were going to support an I2B2 extract out of Epic. They didn't provide any details. It was a single slide with like Epic and then an arrow and then I2B2. <laughs> <laughs> How much did that arrow cost? <laughs> a lot of partners' money, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's, that's all. <laughs> so what do, what, do folk, what do people think? You know, what, what do we need to do? Ideas about uh, funding, ideas about, you know, what you need out of out of this you know, sort of open source 
platform. Let me, let me uh, without uh, suggesting any preferences, let me put out some straw persons out there about different models. And I'd be curious for you to respond in, in how to do this. By the way, let me just recognize Andrew McMurray, who's wearing a gendarme hat. He's <laughs> <laughs> got blue hair, interestingly. Uh, and uh, who, uh, are you living in this, in this part of the country or are you still in the West Coast? West Coast, baby. West Coast, baby, all right. <laughs> they're, they're, therefore, they're gendarme hat. Um, so how do, how do we uh, work uh, together? So there are, I think, two, a number of different ways. One is science project based. And we haven't really uh, talked about that, but we could, in fact, work along the lines of what Ricardo Pilazzi was talking about. Let's implement a patients like this one functionality. And that could be a focus. Then there is, uh, basic uh, software infrastructure um, development. And in either of those two modes, whether it's infrastructure development or science applications, we can have um, philanthropic and uh, philanthropic funding. So let's give an example of that. So um, Trinetics, as you know, made a, a gift to the I2, uh, B2 uh, Foundation which is helping us uh, get off the ground. Should we be working um, to extend uh, corporate uh, gifts like that towards the I2P2 uh, Foundation? Should we be asking um, academic health centers to, do, to make a smaller contribution uh, to uh, support it? Or should we go to the big EHR vendors and say, We'd love to have uh, some small support. So, the gendarme is giving me a big no, but stop, <laughs> stop that. Uh, it's very distracting when we think of gendarme. Um, and then there, are, there is actually the traditional way that ITB2 has been supported. There are, last time we counted, 15 different large grants all over the world, actually, which are covering various ITB2 activities from German national infrastructure to European initiatives to PCORI um, and even some of the precision medicine initiatives that are uh, being funded and a variety of uh, domain based initiatives. And that's also funding uh, large development teams. And so I think there's two questions that I'd like to hear something about, which is what do people think about the funding models and what do think people think about? the models of organization. Should it be uh, just just in time organization around specific projects, or do we need a more broader, sustained um, organizational view? Anybody have any opinions? Okay, John Dorn. Your, your first suggestion was a good one, which is kind of project-based. Um, one thing that we found useful while this, uh, developing Trine was to give somebody a piece of software and tell them nothing about it other than what's in the documentation and ask them to go through and just kind of redline every time something didn't make sense without holding their hands and then eventually holding their hands. There's something to be learned from just um, allowing yourself to be totally open to criticism of, of which steps in an installation weren't understood, whatever it is. So that's, I think that's a important um, uh, point to, make, to be made that the ITB2 community has actually profited enormously by putting software out there and allowing people to innovate which without much guidance. And the, the flip side to that is um, it doesn't speak to the, okay, how do we then fold this into the communal structure and uh, you know, what's the governance around that? What's the funding model around that? And so the question is, at least then, how do you encourage that sort of uh, groundswell project-based approach while um, funding and managing the folding of the, these overall um, individual efforts into the whole? Because that folding in 
um, is necessary if, if you want a first time visitor or even a experienced visitor to see the coherence in the overall project. But obviously that takes a lot of curatorial effort, which is unglamorous uh, and expensive. Other ideas, yes? We talked about a premium model, and I think specifically for the smart apps, when you get into places like this one, but that's tremendously attractive for clinicians, and they're on the side of the house with the And maybe you have a premium model and say, here's two apps that get you to the MIA, and then you crash it up with actual license and use it. So that's actually a, a very interesting idea. So I just want to articulate and expand what I imagine you're saying, and you'll tell me if I, if I get it wrong. And so, in the world of um, patient face, a patient a patient data uh, functionality, there's a classical EHR, and then there's the I2B to view as enabled by smart apps, which allow you to look at the patients. Now, at every level of my own uh, medical education, we always used to do something a little bit on the side of the main system whether it was my former student, Atul Butte, writing uh, scripts, expect scripts that would screen scrape various things out of the service system and the general big postscript file that would have on two sides of the page everything uh, that you wanted on your patient uh, list for sharing, for signing off patients, to um, specialized viewers for the imaging data. And so, you know, Ken and I have referred to this as the sidecar strategy, which is, Let's take the EHR data and let's give a patient uh, view of, of that data within the data repository. And I think that there would be there would be a lot of interest in a Freeman model. Ken, are you still there? He, he, he will be later. He will, I saw him here earlier. And so I know that Ken has established a um, an app uh, an app store for Smart. But I think creating a, um, a, a app store that would support freemium models, I think, would be actually a very interesting idea that I think would get a lot of uh, interest um, because it's actually a lot more, there's lots of activation in it to implement and to install the same app on a ITP2 instance than it is on the underlying EH, transactional EHR system for a variety of reasons. I was thinking one time when uh, I was at the company when we had finished the implementation of that, I'll just say at Midwestern University, we were demonstrating what we had done on the data warehouse and the people. And the reaction of the group was mostly from the clinicians who wanted it and they're putting the work on it. And we said, well, this is the identified data. We can't hear you now this way. But they wanted that interface, that kind of thing. And they were just so enthusiastic about it. Thanks, Wayne. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. That's the most, highest, that's the most <laughs> highly skilled uh, microphone passer I've seen. Yet. Next. Any other any, any other ideas? So everybody can hear. Next. Anybody have any other suggestions about mo mo governance models or funding models? Yes. Yeah. You can start. <coughs> I think one consistent right. lack of. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> yeah, Elaine's getting her morning workout. Ken is back. Can I ask the question? Hold, hold it. So, Ken, you're going you're to speak next. Now we have two microphones. So, one consistent lacking issue that we all see is just sustainability of resources for the complexity, given the footprints that you know, I2B still responds to. And so, uh, I've been thinking for a while about you know, where, where do you get the level of like um, Apache certification or, you know, or uh, I mean, MS certification, something as bundled or complex in I2P2 instance. I think having some idea that you know, there is a value to that and there's clearly capabilities to train in this room and elsewhere uh, would provide a higher level of, 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 um, of visibility. And then possibly there is you know, costs associated with training in terms of more reproducible modules of education. There's maybe compliant with that training. Maybe even CME could come through some of this sort of work. But I think that you know, this has to be raised up to some level of that there is an ongoing cost 
to supporting this. And if we have higher visibility of that, perhaps through that there'll be more of an investment in institutions to maintain that compliance and that certification. We just have a lot of warriors here to yeah. people are doing informatics. So Nick, I think that's a very, very good point, which is because we're all so focused on getting stuff done, we have not focused adequately on actually making visible the actual effort under the hood of maintaining all this. And uh, in some sense, it, it does us a double service. Certainly it does us a service because the need for funding doesn't appear, but it also makes it look too easy. And so as a result, you know, a lot of people say it's not, there's not a lot to it, and it's easier to dismiss, but if people understood how much ongoing support, it might be an easier task to do. Ken, I see that you're back. I just want to, I want to rephrase, and why don't you grab the microphone from uh, Nick? Um, oh, okay, yeah. That one. So I just want to, um, I've been asking for funding and um, or, uh, governance models um, based on Diane's uh, opening about this, and we're trying to get the community to respond. And so our uh, dear colleague here, uh, Mike, uh, suggested that among the models might be a freemium app model. And uh, Mike noted that uh, in some of their, during his recombinant years, there was, for example, a um, healthcare institution where they said, I'd like to see in the app the patient data so I can manage the patient. And even though Mike said this is, was the identified data, that's what they really wanted. And I refer to this as the smart sidecar strategy that you and I had talked about for years, and that, and I hallucinated, because you've told me about this, but I haven't explored it personally, that there's a smart app store that is either out there or is going to be out there soon. But Mike was suggesting that maybe that for the ITB2 community, there can be a freemium model where you get the following apps for free, but people can actually deposit into this app store apps that are not free, and that they uh, they might get some reward to, and or, I guess as part of this, the I2B2 community gets uh, support, because um, implicitly what in Mike's comment is, it's easier to get a app working on a research repository than it is on the transactional EHR system for a variety of technical governance and marketing reasons. So, so that's a long intro to it. So, yeah. so I thought you'd be well placed to, to yeah. comment on that. So that, that's great. You know, we you're not right now. Am I? Uh, so we uh, we heard a little bit about the smart ecosystem from Sean and Kavi uh, published a very nice paper describing the smart enablement of I2B2. And he'll be uh, discussing it later. Good, recently. Uh, so the modularity uh, becomes uh, closer to being capable of supporting an ecosystem with this new smart plugin in I2B2. On the clinical side, uh, which is what Zach was alluding to, very interesting things are happening with the smart platform. Oh, that's the mic side, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really on the Okay, yeah. yeah. So, on the clinical side, interesting things are happening. So we had this idea that there should be an API in healthcare. It was considered cute uh, in 2009. Now, somehow, APIs have become the solution to everything, um, uh, which I think is a pendulum swinging in the other direction, because it's like saying computers are uh, the solution to everything, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the smart API is something very specific. It tells you exactly how to run an app on health system data. Um, by having a very opinionated specification for how that app should run so that the app developer doesn't need to know anything about the underlying system. And therefore, when we had $15 million from the ONC to explore this, we demonstrated smart running on I2B2, we demonstrated running on Cerner, now it runs on uh, Epic, uh, it runs all over the place, and there are interesting things happening, but what we need to do is to converge the clinical community on a standard. It doesn't have to be smart, but since smart works and is free, um, I, I, I don't think there's any particular need for a competitor to it, but if a competitor came along that was better, that would be fine. 
point is, there's a, there's a specification that lets you run apps. The, the top five ER vendors, EHR vendors, are all implementing it in a project called Argonaut um, through Zach's uh, um, political uh, and engineering talent. Uh, the NIH has uh, invested for Precision Medicine Initiative in something called Sync for Science, which is essentially leveraging that EHR effort around SMART to let patients request a copy of their data from the electronic health record for data donation. Let me quickly um, just hum a few bars because it's important for people to know this. So Josh, I'm, I'm, I'm ostensibly the lead of this, but really Josh Mandel uh, is doing all the work on it. Uh, so this is a, an amazing project. Uh, what's amazing about it is actually working. So the White House uh, and the NIH said, we want patients to be able to data donate. Well, we've all heard about under um, meaningful use that Blue Button was going to sol solve all these things. Unfortunately, Blue Button never happened, even though I thought it was mandated. Uh, and so what happened is they approached uh, us under our Big Data to Knowledge Grant. And they said, would you be willing to, uh, under a, a, um, a additional funding, a supplement, then, would you be willing to work with seven vendors who have committed to the White House to actually share data through an API against that transactional system so that individual patients can do, do, donate their individual data to research, whether it's PMI or something else. And to make uh, a long story short, since it's been just recent, since uh, April, Josh has been meeting with those seven vendors and things are going surprisingly well. And this is going to be important for patient health, uh, patient controlled health records, it's going to be important for I2B2, it's going to be important for a whole bunch of apps that um, they are supporting smart fire um, APIs against the transactional system so they can uh, data donate. So things are happening. So Ken, can you just yes. bring it back and just think about the freemium model? Yeah, so um, ONC, people here know what that is, but it's the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, which was a quite important organization that it had $48 billion to direct the spending of, and now is a modestly important organization. But they gave an imprimatur to SMART and this model, this freemium model, recently by, by a, um, awarding us a very modest size grant to actually to further develop our app gallery into an app store. And so, I, and, and I would be thrilled to see if we could get ITB2 community research-oriented apps or clinical apps um, that run on ITB2 working in the store. Why is this important? Why is ITB2 important in this? Because even with Sync for Science, even with Argonaut, it turns out that even when the electronic health record vendors are at their most enthusiastic about supporting third-party app integration, the systems are quite old and complex. And they are not always very efficient um, platforms for running third-party software. And so moving the, some of the action to the side, so alt-tabbing over to an I2B2 instance where the app is running on a replicate of the data that may have been uploaded a month ago or a week ago, but still is pretty darn good, may give both clinicians and researchers um, added capability that they wouldn't otherwise have. And the opportunity to either um, uh, give these apps out for free or to create a uh, business model around them is absolutely supported either way. Would you support? A business model that allowed ITB2 to uh, to the community to contribute apps that part of the proceeds would go to ITB2 Foundation. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and the key um, point about the sidecar also, and I know we're just calling ITB2 a sidecar, but <laughs> kind of put it in the ecosystem somewhere in the clinical world is that the analyses that we do to find similar patients, for example, with the old EMR systems, they just aren't possible, right? That's why they've never done it. It's interesting, so this is the one group maybe that I don't have to go into that hour-long explanation of you know transactional versus analytical databases, but transactional systems like they have in the EHR can't run those, those machine learning algorithms. It just, it just isn't 
it, it's not set up to do that because of the way that the architecture underlies um, those kinds of transactional systems. So I2B2 is the opportunity that we have to build these kinds of population uh, 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 ways of bringing out data in a analytic system and putting it together with the transactional data. So the transactional data, looking at the latest stuff on the patient, would still come from the EHR. And the data based upon the analysis of, okay, what patients look like that and what are they, comes from the I2B2 or the analytical instance. Yes? Hi, everyone. Uh, Gabby, Gabby, the CEO of Trinetics, uh, for those I haven't met. So just a few words. There is money that's coming, and then there's money that I got. I guess we got to work on together to find. So just a small point. Trinetics uh, is committed to uh, supporting the foundation for years to come. No problem there. We're about to close our C-Round, uh, so more money is coming. Um, also, we are committed to supporting every site that joins us. I don't know if people know, we invest $20,000 in each one of our customers by giving them the infrastructure, hardware, to run much more complex uh, processing. Third point, um, you guys are mostly a cost center. So you gotta find someone that wants to use what you're building, and that's how you get funded. And if you don't do it, then those costs are being cut, and there is a lot of competition for things like that. So through Trinetics, We've just given, from Novartis, a couple of very lucrative uh, studies to some of the sites that work with us. And they're going to make money through the Office of Clinical Trials by getting those studies. But there is another industry, if you look at every hospital, each is spending from one to five to more million dollars a year on quality of care and consistency of care and to know that a cancer patient is going to get the same treatment that is best practices as decided by the institution. And that is an industry that was, it developed under our noses, if you will, and it's using completely different technologies. And I think if the community can come together and create the smart apps or anything like that, that could be giving value to the COO, the CEO, the CFO, the chief medical officer at the hospital, and come with a done product, they will fund it. And the question of using an I2B tool or not is not even going to come. It's just going to be something that comes along with those applications. So if you ask me how the community needs to support its members, let's come together, find real uses that have commercial value in the world that are using I2B tool. And then each one of you is going to sell it to their CEO or whatever C-level person and find the money. It's on us to keep our jobs, I would say. So let's just do that. Thank you. Yes. Gil. So I'm Gil Oman from University of Michigan, also representing the Transmore Foundation Board. And I hope many of you will be participating Thursday in the I2B2 Transmore session. Uh, this has been a very positive morning already. And there's so many developments, it's uh, redundant to try to cover all the questions you asked. But I wanted to pick up uh, one particular item which was uh, Janice's description of this uh, opportunity for plugins. Uh, we've had very good experience with plugins from Michigan, some of the tools that we developed back in the National Center for Integrative uh, Omics days. Um, for example, Metscape, any of you who are interested in metabolism, metabolites, this is a very good uh, uh, scheme for flux analysis, Connecting metabolic data, metabolomic data, with genomic and transcriptive data. So it's a plugin at Cytoscape, which is a widely used uh, platform. But it would be natural to put Metscape 2.0 into this scheme. And we have other tools, uh, Metab to Mesh, Genes to Mesh, which is I've used a lot, um, and other tools I think probably everybody in the room does. So thinking how to make your offer and your uh, technical assistance to people who are uh, getting their plugins connected right, as you offer, I think would bring more attention to this platform, more connections, more collaborations, and then the science projects that you already stimulated many uh, would multiply. And one last comment about this. Uh, we have another uh, 
resource we recommend highly, I recommend highly, which is called Concept Gen. This is a gene enrichment analysis tool that was published in Bioinformatics six years ago. It's been relatively modest, uh, modestly used, I would say, uh, but it's excellent. And what we did, was, as an example for everybody else, was to take the other three existing gene enrichment tools and do a fair assessment of the pluses and limitations of each of them, including ours. I think that's a tactic that should be required. So paid off, consumer, paid off consumer reports? Yeah. So it's one thing of a bake off that's going to externally, which of course is a good idea, but in the original reports, we should discipline ourselves to do a fair assessment of our own and, and competitive uh, means of doing some analysis. In that case, our golden rule was describe the pluses and limitations of the others and our own in a way that we would expect that the reviewers would be the developers of those other methods. I'm sure they were. And that's been good. I think that's a good thing. Because one of the problems in our whole field is that we have many, many tools. And most people just use their own. And others reciprocate. And use it for their own. And that doesn't move the field as quickly as we want. Thanks. Oh, hi. Uh, 10.33, that's true. Um, we'll have an opportunity at the end, so don't don't worry. And uh, so let's have a break, and then we'll come back and uh, listen to some other presentations. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mike. So, um, from the point of view of trying to organize um, our discussion into kind of three areas, which are pertinent to different ways that people are using I2B2. We started with um, pulling together some folks who are using it for uh, feasibility studies. Now, that doesn't mean that everything they're gonna talk about is about how to do feasibility studies um, with I2B2, but it kind of like generally groups some things together. And then, um, okay, you don't see it there, but the next group is about phenotyping. And that includes uh, uh, speakers who are gonna talk about the clinical domain as well. And then, oh, thank you. So that includes Jim and uh, uh, Ken. And then, uh, at the end, we're gonna talk about this new vision of pulling big data together using, um, I2B2 and other uh, uh, systems that can talk the same lingo and present the data from hospital enterprise big data systems and potentially an entire country of big data systems into an analytic platform so that we can do these kinds of similar patient analyses, sync for science types of analyses, um, ultimately perhaps, but in the short run really just presenting a way for researchers to get their hands on this on this data in an organized way that we can help them with. So, um, thank you. And uh, first speaker will be uh, Doug uh, McFadden on uh, Shrine. Thank you, Sean. Um, and great, we're already on my presentation. Um, cool. So I'm going to start out with a Shrine update and then lead into. Uh, a presentation from Niche, who's going to talk uh, at more length about uh, some of the, the use cases and the tools that are being built to support um, the, those different use cases. So, um, Shrine, uh, so first of all, um, I'm the CIO for Harvard Catalyst. Harvard Catalyst is the Harvard CTSA. Um, and speaking about the previous funding topic, Harvard Catalyst uh, Fund is sort of the core funder for the Shrine development work. Um, I expect that 99% of you know what Shrine is, but there's 1% of you here that probably doesn't. So uh, I'll quickly remind you. Um, Shrine is a network model put on top of I2B2 instances that allows um, any qualifying investigator at institutions to query the I2B2 data in real time. Um, there's a variety of use cases historically. We've been putting, looking at the aggregate uh, use cases, the 
hypothesis validation, population research, cohort discovery. But as we know, there's a lot of um, new use cases that involve getting to lunar data sets and then actually doing recruitment that uh, Shrine is uh, trying to do its part in. Shrine's a web-based application. It's got a built-in data protection architecture. It installs a top of I2B2. That's what we're all here. Um, open source software. And for a while, this issue of dealing with expandable networks has been a big thing uh, for Shrine. Um, if you were here last year, you would have noted that one of the main things we were trying to address um, over the last couple of years is the original topology for Shrine networks, which um, used the fully mesh model. Um, this works really great when you've got five sites. It does not work so well when you've got 10, 20, 30. Um, the, um, uh, the number of networks out there that are getting bigger is, uh, there's quite a few. In particular, APT from NCATS now has 22 sites. And um, this model, basically, the N squared problem breaks down, um, making it virtually impossible to build and manage these networks. So uh, in, uh, around a year and a half ago, we started building the concept of a hub model. So now Shrine can be configured, uh, a Shrine network can be configured in this fully uh, hub-oriented model. So we no longer have the N squared problem, it's now a straight up end problem, which is great because the ACT network, which has 22 right now, um, sites in it, um, those are 22 CTSAs. Um, the vision being stated by the NIH is to expand it to all CTSAs. So there's 60 some out there, which makes that um, particularly valuable to be able to um, use this topology. But this is all old news because this was in place last year. What I want to talk about is what's happened in the last year and then lead into Niche's discussion. So um, since last year, um, we've released, uh, uh, just a little under a year ago, um, did the 1.19 release uh, with the local data steward application in it. Um, I'm not sure if you're, you're all familiar with what that is. Uh, the local data steward is a way to um, put control of monitoring users and their usage of the, the network back to each site. So um, many networks have been built in the past that had sort of no stewardship whatsoever, and then some were built with a centralized stewardship model. Um, this allowed um, networks to be built where the stewardship was at the edge, essentially, where the users were originating from. Um, all right, in the December timeframe, we did another release. This one included some usability features, better error, error uh, messages. Some of the error messages in the past were exceedingly cryptic, not really helping people. Uh, when you build these large networks, there's some governance rules that basically say, we'll be able to take a look at queries and see who's doing what. So you needed a better way to manage that. And then something for a lot of people in this room that should be, uh, should be interesting is a dashboard application for uh, administration of the Shrine adapter. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that later. Um, if you're not on the 120 release and you're a sysadmin for Shrine at your site, um, you will definitely find some advantages to moving to this. Rather than poking around a lot of log files and config files, um, this gives you an app to manage it. We also did a, an update to the data steward application. And then in the very near future, like maybe next week or in the early July, um, we will be doing the 121 release um, it has uh, a couple of new big features. So the first one being uh, local storage query definitions results. You uh, you Shrine, you'll know that every query you do becomes a previous query. And when you want to go look at that in the past, before the 121 uh, release, um, it had to go out to every node in the network to find out what your previous query actually did. Um, now we're uh, storing that all locally, so it's really fast to go through previous queries. Uh, this also facilitates some future work and um, better management of the network down the road. And then Niche did some great work at integrating. Nick is, Niche, is this formally a plugin? No, it's, a it's an extension to the web client. Yeah, okay. Uh, for doing much better graphing and reporting of query results, in particular, also handling the sort of arbitrarily large networks and showing all the results in a meaningful way for a large network, which is really cool. And uh, he's gonna go into some detail on that later. 
and then we uh, did a, another update in the dashboard app. Uh, really quickly, if you haven't seen some of these things, um, this is the data steward view from a user uh, where they can submit uh, query topics saying this is what I'm going to work on and then see the status. Um, this is the view from the data steward at a site where they're, they can see everybody who submitted a, a request to uh, use the system through these query topics and um, they can make a decision about uh, approving it or not. Um, and then the data steward has been given the capability to basically go in and look at all the queries that each user did um, under each of these query topics so they can actually do their job and make sure that their users are following the rules of the road. Uh, I mentioned the, the sysadmin dashboard. Um, this is a, a quick overview of the dashboard if you want to uh, find out more. Um, there's a bunch of folks from the Shrine team here. Um, try to find them and they can tell you more, or you can go to our website and uh, see a little bit more about what things are now enabled within this dashboard for you to do your administration at your local site. And these are just a couple previews from Niche's extension. Um, this, this preview is showing you the bottom right uh, pane of the uh, user interface for Shrine, and you'll see there's th these tabs here that are part of this extension that show um, your uh, query results in a variety of new forms. Um, and in this case, you can get a full query report with a lot of detail. Can't scroll here, it's just a screenshot, but Niche will show you more in a minute. Um, so um, one of the things I you know, wanted to, to, I'm really excited about talking about here is sort of our future plans. I'd love to get your feedback on this. Um, so we have really two things that we're focused on. Um, one of them is a very pragmatic sort of operational thing. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the feature built into ITB2 and Shrine called the lockout, which you know, is an automatic mechanism for trying to determine if someone is trying to uh, query the data and re-identify individuals in the data set. Um, so we're going to be looking at ways to improve that to prevent false positive positives and just make it easier to manage. But the really, uh, I think, cool stuff down the road is um, to support a lot of these new data access workflows, um, things that I mentioned earlier, these use cases where um, we uh, would like to facilitate getting limited data sets across the network or drill into um, more detailed data. And while Shrine isn't going to do the whole thing, um, Shrine is the starting spot for users. So how can we facilitate, make that starting spot work better uh, within these workflows? Uh, presently, we have this concept of query flagging. So um, you can, uh, within the Shrine uh, web client, you can go to your previous queries and say, this is the query that is of interest to me. Um, and when you do that, you can put a little note on it, and that goes out to all the sites. And so the sites know uh, what you're interested in. Um, there's a lot of other pieces that need to be added there to make sure that um, that that information is used properly. People know when they can move forward to then generate some of these other um, data flows. So um, that's pretty much my segue to go to Niche, because he's the one that's going to show you some of the detail about that. Um, don't forget, if you need to uh, find out more about uh, Shrine, it's available on the open.med.harvard.edu website. And I would be remiss to not recognize Andy McMurray here, with, who was the, had the germ of the idea to create such a thing in the first place. And um, it is out there and a great tool for sharing, uh, not just for Shrine, but several other um, Harvard Catalyst sponsored projects. Cool. Um, so uh, before we transition to Niche, though, um, I, I hope that we don't upset the schedule too much in uh, leaving an open-ended question regarding um, our future plans. These are the future plans that we've come up with based upon what we know about large networks and where people are going. But I'd certainly like to uh, leave a minute for anyone in this room who's you trying to throw out some other ideas of where other problems that uh, could be solved uh, with Shrine. Yes? So one of the things we sometimes have a problem with is network sites. Right. Things, uh, a certain site is down or they're having trouble in 
diagnosing exactly what the problem is without having to reach out to their support team. So it's more real time before you run the query and sit there waiting, 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 and hoping that results at some point. But it's more early feedback on status of the network as a whole before you run the query. Yep. That, that sounds great. Um, I think early feedback is great, although there's a question of what do you do with that feedback? Do you just go back, do you go home and come back later or something like that? But yeah, I agree. I think we've, we've seen this in any large network, the, you know, the number of place, sites that may, may not be up at any given point in time. Certainly, you know, there could be several. So knowing that beforehand makes sense. Other questions or thoughts? Yep, let's go. Uh, Josh Yoder from Ohio uh, State University. Um, so with some of our networks, uh, the sites do not have IPv2 installed. And so we've done some work looking to integrate those networks uh, via uh, having a human mediated query happening there uh, for a back into the data set. Any, any thoughts on making that a better process? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been thinking about that kind of So we've been thinking about that kind of thing. And um, actually in skills, uh, Ken's back there too, uh, we've been... What skills? Um, it's your recording network. All right, Zach, all right, all right, all right. So in skills, which is a shrine-like network for recording, which we run out of, um, out of Harvard as well, um, we've been looking at different, uh, enabling different levels or different types of users. One of them being, so we have the, you know, kind of common data model enabled one that's kind of like needs to have your data in SAS and so forth and to do like formal analytics, which can be a pretty heavy lift. And then you have skills enabled, which is you have to have it in I2B2, but you can do shrine queries and get to recruitment and so forth right off the bat. But then we also have something called uh, uh, skills ready which means that you essentially have a database that could respond to a query, um, but that needs to, you need to actually um, forward it manually. And the problem that we, though, is it seems that we still needed to say you had to have your, your data in I2B2 in some form, because without that, it becomes very ambiguous what query that's formulated in I2B2 means to another database. Now, some databases map a lot better to I2B2 than others. So for example, uh, the PCORI CDM and the OMOP database map actually very nicely to I2B2. They have very, kind of just stack their tables all up on top of each other. And they're actually very similar to I2B2. And so you can, you can imagine a ontology that would exist in I2B2 that could map right into a query that could be done in them. And Jeff Klan, uh, wherever he is, there he is, has done some of this, this, this work and actually done automated transformations back and forth. If you had a really different looking database, like a completely different, like, you know, RDF kind of database or something of that nature, it might be difficult to do that, you know, here's a, form, here's a query formulated using the kind of timing and ands and ors and I2B2, and this is what it means when you run it in the other database. So as with some constraints, we're actually looking at that right now to think about how we can make that even better. Um, um, but, uh, but I wouldn't want to go too far out of that box, because then I think it would get us into trouble. So just a, a, a quick additional comment. I think, you know, just like skills, the act network runs into any network that gets large, you know, you, you start to run into people that aren't natively in I2B2. Um, and so, yeah, similar kinds of strategies that, that Sean just described um, there. I would like to point out that there's actually one instance of a not official I2B2 being hooked up successfully to a Shrine network, which is Griffin Weber's I2B2, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, Griffin? You call it I2B2, but it's not net, right? Well, there's also Transmart, and it works. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's so, a pretty good point. So, yeah, yes. the Transmart can be hooked up to I2B2. Directly. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah. Cool. 
Any other questions? Yes, Andy. As well as members of the HMO Research Network using the virtual data warehouses that are common amongst like 50 plus institutions, those were able to try as well. So there were lots of examples that weren't strictly using um, the Java-based uh, IT research. Good point, thank you. All right, I think it's time to finish. Wanted also to show us some of the latest um, inventions for Shrine and for Skills. Some of the workflow I'll show you is was invented for the Skills Network that uh, Zach had me uh, uh, explain. And uh, in that vein, in Skills, we're actually going one step further, which we can do in Shrine. Uh, I mean, Shrine means it's an Act Shrine, it's a HMS Shrine. So, but you can, so the same software, of course, it's a Shrine software platform. Um, that's working in skills could be done. Now, it goes a little bit beyond um, just doing the counts. So it says, well, you could create a data set automatically out of um, the definitions that you formulated in ITV2 and then put a de-identified or a limited data set together with other sets from other places and do a much heavier analysis. <coughs> that's something we've been pursuing in skills. It takes different permissions, different kinds of IRBs because an IRB would um, need to cover uh, getting limited data sets. You probably need a seed review process in many places to put those together. So, Mitch. Thanks a lot, Sean. So, uh, before I dive right in, the second time, let's just, just dive in. Uh, I'd like to go over a little bit in detail about um, some of the things we've been working on uh, in collaboration with the Shrine team. Uh, also, like Sean mentioned, the plugin that we've been um, refining since last year. And uh, all these combine to a um, very powerful uh, platform for uh, determining feasibility, etc. whether part of the uh, skills network that, that um, Sean already discussed, or, or the ACT project, or, or even part of your local IGB2, um, such as the Biobank portal, at Partners, which uh, you'll hear more about later this afternoon. All right, so diving right in, um, these are the, some of the new features that um, are coming soon to Trine. Uh, we've uh, basically ported some of the work that we've done in the latest version of I2B2. So uh, in the bottom right there, that red circle, there's now a Zoom uh, feature that allows you to expand your results panel in the Shrine web client. And uh, this seems like a small feature, but it leads into these other functionalities that we've implemented uh, in the next slide. Uh, so this is work that was done by Baswadi, Ghosh, and, uh, and Sean, actually. <laughs> Sean's a programmer. To, um, yeah. Hannah, sorry, Sean's daughter. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's a computer science major at well. So when Sean, <laughs> no, never mind, can't make jokes. Sorry, we're recording. All right. Uh, so we've uh, recorded <laughs> some of this uh, the I2B2 graphic work into the Shrine uh, web client. So, um, like Doug already showed, we can show the uh, both the patient counts, aggregate counts coming right back from all the sites, and also the uh, breakdowns uh, if the site's set up for that. And then you can, of course, you can hover over the uh, different uh, graphs to see the actual results. Uh, there's a new print query report functionality that we've also ported. Actually, this is work that was done in the Biobank portal with partners um, by Paswati also. And uh, this is this is cool because what it does is it um, combines all the the query status reports and the graphing results and the figures into this printable uh, report. So there's a print report link at the top, and when you click on it, it's, it, you know, you can now, uh, it's printer friendly and, and, and whatnot. And the last uh, feature that we added uh, into the web client for Shrine is this download results uh, 
feature and what it does. It, it, now the query results that you see in the beginning, usually line by line, it's very difficult to read, um, is now in a tabular format um, that can be exported to uh, Excel uh, as a CSV file. And you would click that download CSV file. And then what you would get is a, a CSV um, of different sites. You can see uh, BI, Children's, Dana for Harper, and Partners. This is just from the Harvard network. And all the breakdowns row by row. Uh, so this is the getting to um, the feature that Doug um, already discussed about, about um, identifying a query that's of interest to you. There's an existing feature in the Shrine for flagging queries. Uh, so you can see, so you can basically, in the previous queries in the, in the Shrine web client, you can right click and, and find the query that, that is of interest and hit flag. And what this does is, um, brings up a little, right now it's a little text box, but it allows you to uh, uh, write pretty much anything you want. And then this gets broadcasted to all the Shrine participants in the network. Um, that this is a query of interest. So I'm going to shift into the next slide. Um, this is I2B2. So this is shifting from the Shrine web client into your local I2B2. Um, this is the I2B2 web client. So what we started building, um, oh, sorry, it's about to restart. <laughs> Windows patch. Uh, so what we started building was a, a, a plugin that uh, this, this piece of the plugin connects to the Shrine adapter and asks for all the previous queries that were flagged. So what you see here is um, all the queries that have been flagged in this network. Uh, there's some filtering options that you can uh, enter, maybe a query name or user ID who ran the query uh, and, and come back. And what happens here is, uh, in the Shrine, a query is run as, as an aggregate query, so all you're getting is aggregate counts. So what this plugin allows you to do is to, um, you can load the query, the Shrine query, and you'll be able to see the Shrine query in, in the I2B2 web client, what that actual local I2B2 query looks like. Or you can uh, one click and create a patient set, which reruns that query in your local I2B2. Um, to create that patient set. And with that patient set, oh, I should have done this, this animation. Uh, this is what it looks like here. And so with that patient set, you can proceed to essentially download um, a limited data set uh, by uh, using this new patient set downloader. And so um, over this past year, we've been hardening this, this uh, plugin since uh, last year from work by uh, David Wang. And um, this, this piece is now running in production uh, in, in partners in the Biomed portal. And so what this allows you to do is uh, specify exactly what your CSV file that you want um, based on the previous queries and concepts that you want to see in your resulting file. So every um, concept that I drag over here line by line is a column in the CSV file that I would see as an output. And as you can see here, for example, for one of the concepts that I dragged over, diseases of the circulatory system, there's a drop down for aggregation options. So these were aggregation options as defined by um, the team, by David and Sean, and, and um, that are available right now in the plugin. So, for example, uh, in the previous slide, this aggregation option, all concepts codes, would give you a um, all the concepts for that patient set. And of course, you can select existence, and that will give you a CSV file based on yeses and nos. Uh, after you generate your file. Uh, you can come to the screen that essentially um, allows you to view all the data downloads that you've done. And then the resulting CSV file looks something like this, um, where this is based on the specifications that I've done 
in the previous slide, and you can see diseases of the circulatory system with all the concept codes and the number of counts um, for each one. And that's about it. So this work wouldn't be possible with, um, without the people on the teams listed here. Thanks. Okay, that's really cool. We've been working on a data builder thing for a while. Uh, I would love to throw mine away and use that instead. Uh, does it do, uh, can you get a thing with one row per encounter instead of per patient? No. Not yet. Don't throw yours away yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and can you tell me anything about performance, about how long, you know, if I, if I have 10,000 patients in my set, and I want to know all their ICD-9 codes, does it melt? Right. So, um, we've gone through three different kind of development levels on this. The first one was kind of a prototype. This one uses web services, which is great because it fits in well in a distributed query environment, and it can and it has all the kind of security hooked into it, but it's slow. So a really big table, and it can do a big table with thousands of patients and 100 columns, it will take like hours. Barbara, who's uh, the annoying who's sitting here, is working on the SQL version of that. Now, of course, it has to be done for each kind, you know, Oracle, SQL Server, and um, uh, Postgres. But, of course, the SQL version of that, which does this pivot, essentially, is like hundreds of times faster. And so she's working on it now, and we'll demo it for one of the Emerge meetings coming up. But that will enable this to be much higher throughput, so we'll be able to generate these tables in seconds or minutes at least, um, instead of um, hours, even if they're really big. And then manage them through the previous query structure still. So you go to the previous query, and it's like, there's a table, right? And you click on that, and then yeah, just, and just to add, um, since this is our third iteration of this thing, we've been working on it for a long time, and uh, this version actually allows you to, since a lot of the stuff is running on the server side, it allows you to close the web client so you don't actually have to wait. So even though it's a couple hours for some of the very large patient sets, you can, uh, especially in the biobank portal in partners, we instruct uh, the users to just you know, you don't have to wait for this. You can come back to your history window later on and you can see basically all the all the jobs that have yeah, we, we just send a mail because it's gonna be one. <laughs> sure. yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So a format that a lot of researchers are just familiar with working with is something that looks like the BDW or the Cornet data model. Is that about exporting in that format? Yeah. So, so like the faster the faster plugin that Sean was talking about that uses SQLs, CDM transform is also a SQL transform. So it's very fast, but it would require a little bit of creativity to fit it into the web client plugin framework. Maybe if we did a some kind of a CRC plugin combined with the web client plugin, we could we could pull it off. But uh, if if the user were willing to run some SQL code, it would be quite possible and very straightforward. But that requires access to probably. The access to the SQL database. Yeah, so, right. So we, Although it can be run as a server side plugin. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's. And then. Somebody if it works a plugin, plugin, then you'd be able to do it. Right, it's a server side plugin in that case, and so it runs it on the server side, all under the permissions, you know, nobody can get access to the database. So, how hard would that be? Yeah, so, you've got the interface for ordering it, and 
just have to add the, that thing, that transform to what you already have, right? Um, so it was, it was really hard, actually. Uh, how many months did you spend on it, Jeff? Well, Aaron took a crack at it. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 but, but the point is that it ties into race, too. Sure, no, we, we, but the interface would just be like build the Cornet database, yeah, right, yeah, click, yeah. right, yeah. out of this patient cohort. And, um, you know, you know, oh, absolutely, sure. And, and, um, uh, and it would get you a the Cornet database, which is often one step removed from what you really want for your analysis. So what you really want for your analysis is usually this. So that usually what you want for an analysis, so if you think about all the R analyses that Transmart does, for example, or which, of course, you were intimately uh, part of, and all the other, and, 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 and what comes out of uh, kind of the pre, you know, uh, big table that comes out that you wanted to run an analysis on, it almost always is some kind of version of this. Whether it's coming out of I2B2, whether it's coming out of OMA, whether it's coming out of the PCORNET CDM, or whether it's coming out from Database X. And so what this is trying to do is kind of be a little bit of a lingua franca, actually, for something that you feed into the next stage of an analytical system. So in that way, uh, transforming it into a PCORNET CDM would be great if you wanted to run, I mean, they don't even have any algorithms, just to take this down this rabbit hole, that run on a SQL system. They run in SAS. So you'd have to import it into a SAS data set to actually run one of their algorithms. OMOP is better, right? They've got some things that run on SQL. So that would be a, 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 a you know, getting it wrapped up into an OMOP database would be, would be better in terms of making it so more analytics can run. But um, even OMOP, which we were part of that partnership, makes it into this flat table before they run the analytics on it. So I think that, um, you know, what Niches and his team are enabling here is just the ability to make that pre-analytic set. Um, and in skills, that's the point, is that we want to get into a pre-analytic set so people can build their R algorithms or um, whatever their analytic platform is and then put it in the grant and get it. So Aaron, if sites have used the CDM ontology that we've made, and they use this plugin to build a data set, yeah. does that satisfy the same need? Yeah, just the need of the interface. But if we just use the same interface, then people yeah. can drag yeah. over yeah. concepts from the yeah. CDM. Yeah. Yeah. Everything always seems simple. Yeah. The, the rule is, if it seems simple, it's really hard. If it seems hard, it's impossible. Great job, Jack. So Jack will be speaking next on Disney Okay. Okay, uh, how come, oh, now, da, da, da. go on, there we go, okay, I'm going to discuss uh, using I2B2 data to determine clinical trial feasibility and how we, uh, it's being used currently in the Trinetics network. Um, just like to state a disclosure, besides being a faculty member at Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson, I've also been consulting with Trinetics, particularly on this particular topic of how you use I2B2 cancer data for cancer clinical trials, which are a little bit different. I'm going to go brief overview of the cancer clinical trial accrual problem, uh, then uh, our participation in the Trinetics network and how that's been working out 
and then I'm going to give a six minute screenshot movie, a little quick time movie, of actually using the application to determine clinical trial feasibility for a real life trial. I'm doing the quick time because at my age, my cardiovascular infrastructure cannot take the stress of a real life demo. <laughs> now, basically, a few years back, uh, the Institute of Medicine discussed a problem confronting clinical trials research that still exists today, and that's that studies fail to complete because they don't uh, accrue uh, the participation of the statistically required number of patients for that trial. The Institute of Medicine report actually focused on, cooperative, on cancer cooperative group trials. However, um, it's more extensive than that. Uh, in addition to cooperative group trials, institutional, your investigator-initiated trials, um, and pharma trials, either that pharmaceutical firms do completely in-house or in collaboration with academic uh, uh, groups, as well as these cooperative group trials often fail to complete because of insufficient, insufficient patient uh, recruitment. I should have done a movie of the whole thing. Anyway. Um, <laughs> The non-accruing trials, of course, consume a lot of funds, institutional funds, pharmaceutical money, et cetera, without providing any return on definitive research findings. Now, actually, there's probably, from my perspective, a, a, um, a greater cost, and that's while many of these trials accrue zero patients, a fair number of them accrue a few, a few patients, just not statistically enough patients, you know, three or four here. Now, in the cancer world, uh, about three to five percent of all cancer patients participate in cancer clinical trials. It's a very low number. And so it's a valuable resource. And it's squandered when you have three patients enrolled on a trial that never really comes to any. Uh, definitive conclusion. And so that's a, a tremendous cause on a nationwide basis. We're talking thousands of individuals who participate in trials that never uh, come to any fruition. Uh, we did a study a few years back, it was um, published in Jania, in which we said, oh look, we have our I2B2 research data mart. When a, a clinical trial is in its design phase, when you come up with the eligibility rules, <coughs> Use, uh, define your cohorts for the past two or three years that correspond to that uh, clinical trial uh, criteria and see whether you have sufficient number of patients. And as I said, it was published in the results. The overall result of the study is that yes, the methodology accurately predicts failed accrual. In other words, that the patient population at your institution has not existed in the past two, three years that correspond to the eligibility rules. Now, um, there may be an odd situation. You just recruited a, a fantastic a pancreatic cancer oncologist, and even greater, he's local, so he's going to bring up a, a bolus of patients with him on day one, et cetera. That might affect a trial that was going to open. Other than that, we found that if our methodology predicts you don't have the patient uh, uh, population for that trial, whether it's a cooperative group or your own uh, trial that an investigator is, is, uh, uh, has designed, don't open that trial. Look and see, perhaps you can tweak the eligibility criteria in certain ways that don't affect the objective, the scientific objectives of that trial, and perhaps the trial can be open with modified uh, criteria for eligibility. Um, as a corollary, by the way, if our method said, oh, you have the patience for this trial, go ahead, uh, it's going to succeed, you have to... <laughs> You have to realize, maybe it won't concede, there are other factors that then come into play once you, you have the, the patient subpopulation uh, for this trial. Um, we have found in, in further work that competing trials, a trial that opens you know, six months later with the same subgroup of patients, is going to perhaps pull away, or even an existing one. But if it says it's going to fail, trust it, it will fail. Now, the Trinetics Clinical Research Network was born 
uh, out of uh, in pharma, they have the same problem.